thanks, Janet. Um, so I know that there are some questions, uh, but what I'm going to talk talk about today is, of course, um, I think I promised that last week that we're going to talk about the serotonin. Well, and as luck has it, ABC7 put me on the interview. So actually pretty long. They uh, interviewed me for half an hour and they put about half of it. So if anybody's interested, what I'm starting to do is I'm going to put the study first, then I'll put the ABC7 entire piece because we're not going to be able to cover all of it. Um, and then on top of that, I actually did record it on my end. And so I'm going to also post the whole interview with Victoria Sanchez here. So the last one is the on my YouTube channel. Um, so, you know, it's a fundamental article. Um, basically, the, the point of it goes like this. Um, it turns out that pretty much in universal association of long COVID with low serotonin level, Nothing surprising, but the quality of the study is what really stands it out and what's important. Not only did they figure it out that that's the case, and I'll get into that in more details, but it turned out that it's actually linked to particular uh, pathways. So, and there's a, like four or five of them. I'm going to just list some of them. If you need to, if you want to learn all the details, I suggest watch the YouTube video because we discussed pretty deep detail the entire the entire study there because it's all more it's about 30 minute interview um so th there are a couple of key points the first point and probably the most important is inflammation so we all know that serotonin drop is closely linked to inflammation antidepressants they're not actually antidepressants it's just anti-inflammatory don't, they don't work by raising serotonin that's all bs it's been debunked um, many many years ago so they don't really have an anti depressive activity of any kind. They're just anti-inflammatory drugs that, that operate through the balance of the central and peripheral balance of serotonin. Uh, but serotonin as a molecule turns out to be a pretty important in regulating autonomic nervous system, not just in you feeling well, um, certain levels of serotonin do correlate with how we feel. So low levels are correlating with depressive mood, higher levels are supposed to be protective against that. But the most important point here is not related to that. The most important point is that, you know, when the levels drop, it seems to correlate strongly with um, disturbances in autonomic nervous system. Uh, of course, the authors incorrectly uh, speculating that antidepressants are going to fix this problem. Of course, they won't fix this problem. They may have some benefit, but, you know, we've... Um, we have a lot of patients with long COVID on antidepressant. It doesn't seem to do a thing, and I wouldn't expect any benefits. But, you know, of course, the studies will have to be done, and that this is, you know, this is cell. So it's the best, actually, it's the best molecular journal, I believe, in the, in the world. Um, and, and the article not only deserves to be there, it's actually a very critical article because of the way they assessed all of this and the way they linked it and the way they finally said yes. This is the consequence of prolonged inflammatory response after the viral infection. So before that, this was speculation, right? Now we have not only the articular presentation of it, but we have a detailed molecular mechanism, which I'm not sure how insurance is going to say, no, this doesn't exist anymore because they're still trying. We have a lot of patients who are kind of getting their care refused because insurance says, no, nah, you don't have anything. Uh, the question is, will the serotonin measures at some point become part of the practice. I doubt it. Uh, it has always been just a research tool. Uh, there are tests that look into the urine uh, metabolites, uh, both pre and post cursors of the serotonin. I've done those tests for many years back about 10 years ago, and I stopped because they seemingly were useless. They didn't really help me to direct the care one way or the other. But the tests are available, and so it would be interesting to see if the next phase of this study will be an attempt to look deeper into correlation and say, okay, let's try a bunch of things, and let's see what happens here. So let's say, let's give someone Prozac and monitor their serotonergic level and also then monitor if they're, you know, if they're long COVID improves. I mean, I'm sure that's coming. I'm sure that's the the next step, which should happen actually, because what if I'm wrong and there is serotonin, SSRIs, selective serotonin reactive inhibitors will be working, It'd be amazing. Intuitively, I say waste of time, but you know, I've, I've, <laughs> I'd be happy to be proven wrong on this one. 
So, um, of course, we talked about tryptophan. Uh, so the second point is that the study did show that uh, there is a difficulty in conversion tryptophan, converting tryptophan from food to the actual levels of serotonin. Well, that's also quite expected because that's how we make serotonin. We make serotonin through multiple steps. Very slow first step is to take tryptophan from food and then convert it to something called 5-HTP, which is a 5-hydroxytryptophan, which is actually more direct precursor through several other steps. So in clinic, we usually look, use 5-HTP. We don't use tryptophan because that's kind of slow and 5-HTP is readily, readily available as the, as the supplement and, and usually somewhere between 50 to 100 milligrams can easily raise serotonin. It's also part of our standard care when we titrate or slowly discontinue antidepressants because you need to kind of bump up the serotonin when you're dropping antidepressants slowly. But there's nothing wrong without eating higher tryptophan foods. So you know, if you like your turkey on Thanksgiving, by all means, if you're vegetarian. Um, I got caught off guard because the, the reporter kept asking, well, so what are the vegetarian sources of tryptophan? And I'm like, oh my goodness, I need a nutritionist. Um, we had to Google it. I actually think that that's fine. So I Googled. So it turns out seeds uh, are very high. Uh, for some reason, I remember chocolate, but I don't think that's correct. Mm. But anyway, if you're vegetarian, don't worry because tryptophan actually is not an essential amino acid, so you can get it from other sources. So that's fine. But of course, meats and, and animal protein is fine in tryptophan. Um, and the idea would be just like we would always recommend after you acutely ill in your recovery, you want to bump up your protein intake. So it would be quite good to try to take it very regularly at a little bit higher amount that you usually would be. So that's that was the whole conversation there. Um, that's something you don't need to have a guidance on. The moment if you want to consider 5-HTP or any kind of uh boosters of the serotonergic production like magnesium B6, you probably should work with someone. So that was also discussed in that presentation. Um, so I think, let me see if there's something else I want to talk about this here. Oh, um, I think that's kind of important. They did look into the effects of several things on mice. Again, um, when you you have to be very careful that studies from mice to humans often by the time you correlate things don't really pan out the way that things look in mice. Um, but in this case, what they have observed is that they fed mice high tryptophan diet and they actually partially bypassed a problem, uh, which is a good thing. You you would want that. Um, so so again, that's that's a part of the part of that whole study. Um, I'm expecting that this would be one of the most quoted study on long COVID. I also expect that this, that this will be massive push after this towards antidepressants, towards anti-inflammatory approaches. Um, I'm guessing we're gonna see studies that are looking at things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, particularly things like Celebrex, so COX-2, that they will be looked up on to see if that can long-term help the patients with long COVID, et cetera. So, all right. Um, is Dr. Kogan freezing? I don't know. Am I freezing? Are you guys? Any problems with how I... No. Well, maybe Jennifer is freezing. I'm not sure. Okay. Um, let's do the questions. Um, I don't think we need to rush. I know Cecile had a question about... I'm going to put this in the chat. She had a question about what flu shot we should be getting. Uh, she sent a CDC link. So I'm going to put that in the chat. So that I think we covered it before, but it makes sense to talk about this again. By the way, the flu vaccine is a good time to get them now. Anywhere from now until probably towards the mid-November would be perfect timing. I have not seen cases of flu just yet. It doesn't mean flu is not here yet. It just means it's still at the low numbers. And so if you're over 65, you need to get what's called the high dose vaccine. Um, maybe I should share a screen. Let me do that. Let me share a screen because otherwise it's not sort of clear. So this is the CDC webpage. Let me just move this thing. 
Okay, so everybody can see this? You can see my screen? Yes, no? Yes, okay. All right, so what you're seeing is the actual different vaccine options you have. Um, I believe GW carries a Fluria a standard and then flu zone high dose. If you're very allergic to eggs, that was Cecil's question, should we take eggs or no eggs? Well, it only depends if you have an allergy to egg. If you don't have allergy to egg, it shouldn't really matter. You can definitely get eggs. I, I do recommend that you try to get single vial use. So you see there is a multi-vial use and there's a single vial use, so 0.5 and 5. 5 means there's 10 doses. Don't get this. This contains mercury. So try to always get 0.5. Um, well, actually, I don't, I don't know if this contains mercury because it's for kids. Uh, my understanding is all kid vaccines don't have mercury anymore. For, oh, actually, there is. There we go. So you see on the right, it tells you if there if there is a mercury or not. So there is the, uh, and put it in context, what's 25 micrograms? It's a piece of tuna. So it is a significant amount. You don't want to, you don't want to have that if you don't need that. Um, so um, if you're going to go for high dose, these are your choices. So you see it says high dose. You have one, and then you have, it should be two. Where's the other one? Something is missing here because is there at least two high doses? And I don't know what why there's only one here. But okay, no, so the, at it's least the, it's the one for 18 and over, but below below the 265. No, I, I only see one high dose right here. Oh, you're right. Sorry. So no, no, no. There's no it has oh the fluid. This is the high dose. It's a, it's a mistake. This is not a standard dose. Fluad is a high dose, quadrivalent vaccine. Both of this quadrivalents are high dose. So I don't know. See, this is why they're for 65 plus. They're both eggs. Um, I thought there was non-egg, but it looks like this one is, is a, a flurry is a regular dose, regular vaccine for everybody. So now, will you be a miss if you get the regular one? Well, you know, if you are 66 and you're completely healthy, I'd probably say, who cares? Just get whatever. Um, but if you're way older, let's say you're over 80, I probably would target this. They're, they're designed to have bigger uh, immune boosting capacity. So I would I would recommend you try to find that, try to find high dose. But this are all single vial, by the way, which is also, you don't have to worry about. So if you get either the fluad high quadruplet or flu zone, high dose quadruplet should be the same. They probably just forgot because there's definitely flu at high dose. And this is supposed to be, I think it's just a mistake here on a website. Uh, I don't believe that this is correct. Um, okay, so I think, Cecil, that was your main question, I believe, right? In there, I don't know if you, let me look at your other, because you had a long, like there were more than one part to the question. So, so there, there, there are three doses that could be taken by someone 65 and above because there's one that's 18, 18 and over for anybody. Yeah, you don't want that one because that's the regular one. So if you want to get high dose, you have to get the one that's specifically 65 plus. That's the difference. So those are the only two choices, is either flu out or flu zone. And that's been the, the case for the past, I don't know how long. Uh, I'm pretty sure that GW carries only flu zone. Uh, I think the flu ad that we have is a regular one. Maybe I'm wrong. I, I don't know. I haven't actually looked at this And, this and it year. says on the flu odd, that, that the one you just showed, that there's an adjuvant on that flu odd. Yeah, that, that's what I'm trying to tell you. I think that's incorrect. I, I think CDC has it wrong on their website. I'm not kidding. Because Thank my you. understanding, looking at it, uh, yeah. um, one second, you guys, uh, I have to take it. So, guys, 
one of the things I'm I try to do is collect all the links that people drop in the chat and then include them in the post um, event email. I have to apologize for sending the email aids out <laughs> so late um, this time, but I will be a good girl and send it out immediately after this meeting. Okay. Thank you, and Jenna. You're welcome. And since we're a smaller group today, we're we're at 22. If anybody has any questions, just unmute yourself and ask it. If you don't feel like typing in the type box, chat box, you know what I mean. <laughs> Sorry, you all. Um, we have car problems, so I'm gonna um, let the mechanic. They were gratefully giving me this room, but uh, they had to check in with me. All right, so I'm back. Um, um, all right, so so I, I actually don't want to spend more time on this particular question because it's uh, so, so I think you've gotten a little too far out with this. I don't think you need to worry about any of this points so of your questions. I don't think they're relevant to pretty much anything whatsoever. Just get a, either one. Um, it doesn't really matter. Again, the only true difference is if you... Um, if you are allergic to eggs. So if you're allergic to eggs, you need to get the non-egg one and you cannot, I think, then get a high dose. I think all the high dose have eggs. Um, just remember that, which is okay. I mean, look, even the regular one is going to work. It's just not gonna work as effective, but it's still gonna give you some protection. So, so that's said, that. In, in the mm -hmm. description that, that was at the beginning, it said, even if you have an egg allergy, you didn't have to worry about the, the, the dose with eggs. That's what they say. Um, I think the general recommendation is you probably would want to discuss this with your provider because, you know, the egg allergies are quite um, variable. You know, you may have a, like, I will tell you, if you had a like an allergy test and it showed egg allergy, but you eat eggs and you're fine, of course, get the shot. I don't think be perfectly fine. But if you have a very strong reaction, you may want to check in with your doctor. That's what I would say, because the, I think CDC says that because the amount of egg um, in there is really, really tiny. And so at least theoretically, most people who are allergic to eggs are going to be just fine. But, you know, I, I don't want to step over that point because, you know, I, we would need, I would need to know someone really reasonably well because I will tell you that there are people who have severe reactions to this egg-contained vaccines. And, you know, is it... So you need to know that. So I would just say, I would just caution, basically. All right. Um, Elizabeth saying, couldn't get latest COVID till past. Okay, how long do I need to wait? Um, give it two weeks. I think that should be fine. Um, you know, there there are saying CDC is now aggressively pushing everybody to get both shots at the same time. There's just another study came out that that's okay. The problem with all these studies is that they're very short lasting. Like they they give you a result. Like they look at this. Okay, no side effects for five days. Okay, well, what about two months or five months or a year? Nobody's going to look at that. You're not going to have an answer. So from a pure kind of abundance of caution, I say at least two weeks between them. Um, so that means that if you got it on 24th, you, you can get, you know, flu shot second week of November. So this, I think it should be fine. I, I don't think that we're going to see spike. Um, so. But for flu, for flu, you had said to wait until we got notice of a flu season. Do, do we has flu started? No, yet? I never said that. No, 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 no. I never said that. I think you're missing. You said it was coming later this year. No, no. I never said we'll wait until flu is announced. There's no such thing. Um, because it's just nobody's gonna announce flu arrival. I said wait until late October. That's what I said. And then after that, you can start getting it anytime you want. So okay. that's why I'm saying right now you can get it any anytime now. Yeah. Um, the same goes for RSV. My practice with RSV goes, I, I think we already talked about this several times, goes like this. If you're relatively healthy, you less than, let's say, 75, you don't have any chronic lung disease, I don't recommend it. I want to see and wait what's going to happen. One of the reasons I predict mild RSV season this year, because the last three years was bad, um, that's not what CDC says. That's also not what consensus is. But regardless of that, 
you know, that's my personal opinion. Um, so at 76, if you never had any long problems, I probably wouldn't get the RSV. I would just see how the season goes. If the season turns bad, you can always get a little bit later. But right now, I haven't seen a single case. I don't think anybody have. Um, if you're really desperate and you want to get it, by all means, it's not like I'm opposing it. I'm just saying it's a brand new vaccine. There's actually also major shortages. That's another issue. So because there are major shortages, my suggestion is maybe give it, give to those people who really need it. Who's really needing this? Anybody who has a chronic lung problems, chronic emphysema, chronic asthma, um, lung cancer, uh, any kind of prolonged lung disease, definitely get RSV vaccine for sure. Like don't even just think of it, just get it. Even if you're 60 or even if you're 55, the age there doesn't really matter a whole lot. What's essential is that you do or don't have that condition. And then also if you're quite, like if let's say you're over 80 and you have other chronic problems that could rapidly, that could cause rapid deterioration, that may be more of a consideration. Talk to your doctor, I would say, and make a decision whether it's worth it. But if you're, say, below 80 and you're otherwise reasonably healthy, I'm not sure that's a vaccine I would push for at the moment. I think the COVID and flu are much more important for all kinds of reasons. Um, so just because vaccine is available doesn't mean everybody should be getting it, right? I mean, that's really the, the, the point here. Even, even though they're trying to recommend it, I think the reason they're doing this because that the last year RSV was relatively bad. There were a lot of really sick people. So the vaccine was welcomed. My concern is because the COVID is still here and because RSV is unclear and it's a nice similar vaccines. I'm, I'm concerned giving them, their, but they both mRNA. So I'm con concerned giving, giving them closely together. Now, there is an option, right? So you, you have Novavax. Uh, Novavax is hard to find. I've uh, had several patients calling all over and nobody seems to carry them. Um, so if you can get Novavax, I think that's an option because it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's not a mRNA, it's an old technology, it's an egg-based. So if you're really concerned about mRNA, then you can get it. Okay, any other questions? Haven't you said flu is cold? Flu is a cold weather disease in the flu vaccine. I never said flu is a cold weather disease. Um, that's completely incorrect. It has nothing to do with outside temperature whatsoever. It's just the seasonal variations. It, I don't think it's related to weather. Um, so, and it's also, I never said it lasts for two months. What I said is that it doesn't last for six months. That is correct. Um, and so, you know, if you get it, let's say in September, and then you add six months, come March, you basically unprotected against flu. And there's no point getting the vaccine at that point, even if it's available, because by that point, flu virus completely mutated it. So the best time to get flu vaccine, in my opinion, is somewhere between late October to late November, like those four, four weeks, uh, because you will then add six months. And if you add six months to late October, let's say November 1st, so then you have May. And by May, flu is usually gone. So this is, this is that window that I'm describing. Uh, of course, it's imp imp imprecise. Of course, everybody has individual variability. There's some built-in error in all of this. And also every year is a little different. So some years the vaccine does better. Last couple of years, vaccine did really poorly by the spring. Protection was less than 20%. So basically there was almost no protection whatsoever. Um, but again, it, it doesn't mean you shouldn't be getting it because that's by the end of the season. In the beginning of the season, usually flu vaccine somewhere between 30 to 60% efficacious, which is kind of pretty decent for a flu vaccine that's constantly mutating and changing. So I don't change my recommendations based on the weather whatsoever, even if we have no winter at all, which seems like, you know, with the global warming, that may be the trend, so. All right, any other questions? We're gonna take a couple of more minutes before we switch to the mind-body part.
Well, let me ask everybody. I don't know if you're comfortable. Um, who in the, who by now gotten the COVID vaccine? Just put put like a hand in the chat or something. Or just raise a hand if you're on the screen. Yep. So I saw I saw Kevin and so Richard. All right, Cecil. Monica. Sharon. Elizabeth. Okay. All right. So decent share of people. All right. Right. So if Jennifer had saying she had COVID in July, I agree. I don't get one now. So if definitely wait to sometime in July or so. All right. All right, good. I think this was the last disruption here. Okay, should Paxlovid be taken even if symptoms of COVID are mild? Yes. So if you over a certain age, probably hard to say exactly what that number is. In fact, maybe everybody should be taking Paxlovid. Here's the reason, because you have to do everything to avoid long COVID. We're still seeing patients. I just had another long COVID patient who had a COVID three months ago, very sick, like horribly sick, barely moving, barely walking gets up falls down gets up falls down so do be afraid of long covid i don't really nobody gets in the hospital i had a single patient in the last year and a half going to the hospital with covid but um, we're still getting long covid patients even with the best optimal care so that person i'm talking about took the paxlovid didn't take any vitamins so i say do whatever take all the vitamins take paxlovid do everything you in you know eat anti-inflammatory diet if you have capacity to do some other detox like going to sauna whatever you can you need to do it because unfortunately we don't know who will who will not get it like there's no way i can look at you and say okay don't take paxlovid you have no chances of getting one quality we have no clue how that happens yet that Today's study I told you about may shed some light. So it's possible that if somebody is starting with a low serotonergic level, they're going to be at the higher risk. Is that going to pan out? We'll have to wait for studies. It doesn't actually help that. It just gives us a mechanism for further inquiries. It doesn't tell us this is what's happening. Uh, but again, yes, the answer to this is absolutely yes. Get a Paxlovid. If you're traveling, make sure your doctor gives you Paxlovid to take with you on a travel where it's, especially if you go to a foreign country where you can get the prescription um, just because I think the chances are reasonable, right? So even if you're vaccinated, there's still a high chance you're going to get some symptoms. And if you do, you should take Paxlovid. So um, let me cover one other thing, which I almost forgot. There seems to be a lot of evasion of the current tests. Um, I've had some patients do three, four or five tests and only one would be positive. So uh, that just means, please make sure that if you still have tested in at home, that you check them. If they expire, throw them out. Apparently when they expire, they really don't work. Um, I thought they do, but they don't. That's a kind of correction from before. And get new ones. Always have some rapid tests at home because you just never know. Things always happen Friday night, right? Um, so make sure you have test tests at home. Uh, my understanding is you can easily get them for a couple of dollars at any store. Uh, you can also get them online. I'm not sure you can find free ones anymore. I think they're kind of they're kind of gone. But even if you did get them, just again double check they may be already expired by this time. Um, okay. Doc said can take Paxlovid and Eliquis together. That is correct. Um, no, that is completely wrong. You cannot take Paxlovid and blood thinners at the same time because of metabolism issues. So um, same with statins. So there's a whole list. You cannot get Paxlovid without talking to your doctor. You, If you're taking any medication, it, they have to be carefully assessed against all your list of, in, of, against your entire list of medications. There are lots of interactions with Paxlovid statins blood thinners some antidepressants it's a long list of things um blood, blood pressure pills mostly okay um 
you know, I'm just thinking of the very common medications like uh, sleeping pills are okay. You guys can ask. Uh, the like uh, antihistamine pills are okay. It's like a very common medications. Many of them are okay, but again, you you need to at the very minimum you can just Google this. You can Google. There's a uh, multiple lists showing which medications you cannot be on, which you need to stop. Like for example, statins is not a big deal. As long as you hold them for five days and you can totally do that, don't nothing's going to happen to you if you don't take statins for a couple of days. But if you're on a blood thinner, you have to talk to a doctor because you may or may not be able to stop Eliquis at all. I can't comment on that. It depends on why you're on Eliquis. It depends on what the dose. It depends on how long you should be staying on it. There's just too many variables. I, I You need to talk to a physician. Um, yeah, so I've heard that some docs do that. They wouldn't prescribe Paxlovid ahead of time. I can't comment on that, Curry. It's unfortunate. I, I think I would expect people to be thoughtful about this. Uh, Paxlovid is not a shortage at all. I changed the doctor. Can I, say? I mean, I don't know what to tell you. It, it's some people just for whatever reason feel strongly one way or another. I, I don't, I, I can't comment on that. I'm sorry. Uh, we give it with no problem to all of our patients who, I mean, I, I wouldn't just give it to everybody. I wouldn't just have it sit there because it will eventually expire and it's just waste. But if you are going on travel, especially if you're going to a place that, that you know, like let's say you're going to Safari in Africa or something, uh, or South America, you definitely need to carry some medical travel pack, right? I mean, all kinds of things can happen. Like you need some antibiotics, you need some anti-diarrheal agents, you need probiotics, you need to make sure you checked your all your travel things. And I give a Paxlovid to, for now to everybody, unless we see what happens next. But COVID is everywhere right now, everywhere. We had practitioners sick, we had patients call us probably anywhere from five to 10 per week in the last, that's just my patients. I'm talking about me, me alone in a practice. So, cause I can't keep up with everybody there. All right. Um, let's do one more question and then we'll try to do a little bit of mindfulness here. Okay. No questions. All right. Well, um, I'm going to first talk a little bit about something, but I encourage you to get comfortable. You can lay down for this. Uh, if you need to, you can stay, stay seated. Um, I'm going to talk about our relationship with elements. Um, those of you who've come to some Sufi classes or have been following this talk have heard me give five elemental breath, which we will do. But before we do that, I want to just to talk a little bit about our relationship with elements. Um, if my original plan was to actually be in the cabin and kind of walk around the house and, and show you just in nature the elements. But, you know, my encouragement would be if you, you can close your eyes and you can just connect to each element and I'm going to list them in the order. And we will be doing the breath at the same time. But my point is, is the, the whole idea of this practice today for the next 20 minutes or so is to deepen our relationship with the elements in nature that are all around us. And we'll start with the earth. So we are fully supported by earth physically. It's a place we walk on. It's the place we stand on. Place that gives rise to our food, place we return to after this journey. It's a planet that we live on. And this element is dense. This element is heavy. This element physically representing the weight of our body. It physically represents our physicality, our tissues. You can compare it to um, your bones and your muscles. It has the color usually represented being yellow or brown. And if you need a point of connection, 
you can feel the sit bones, you can feel the base of the spine. And if you're sitting on a chair, that's fine. And But you can imagine sitting on the ground on the earth, maybe touching a tree with your back or maybe just sensing the earth under your feet, under your buttocks, imagining this exchange of energy with each inhale and exhale. And for earth breath, we breathe in and out of the nose. On an inhalation, sensing the energy of the earth being drawn through the base of our spine into our body. And then on exhale, returning that energy back. Letting the deeper connection allowing for sensation of heaviness to settle in, imagining that we are, that our weight is on earth, that we are connected all the time, not just energetically, but also physically. We walk on earth, sit on it, we drive our cars, they left us all around us. In and out of the nose. So this practice of Balancing elements is probably one of the most fundamental that I've ever came across. I believe it's one of the most important breathing techniques, not only because of the potential depth of meditative experience, but because it's very good for balancing nervous system. So it has pretty profound medical application, especially when you know your breath tends to be shallow or tends to be heavier on inhale or exhale. Take two more earth breaths. And let's go ahead and transition to the water. So inhale through the nose, exhale through the mouth. I want you to tune into the water element. Imagine the body of water that you prefer. It could be a lake, a river, ocean. Tune into that body closely. Position yourself being next to it. Imagine you're touching the water. Gradually merging your body, putting your body inside this water body. Sensing how water flows all around you first. Soon as you're comfortable with sensing the water on your skin, you can imagine water cleansing all your tissues, flowing through all of your vessels, space between your cells, each cell, washing off part of your body with its energy you can imagine the color deep green kind of a dark green green and blue together 
and sensing the connection to water through your belly button, through the center of your belly. With each exhale, imagine how impurities pass through, dissipate, and the water takes away all of the dirt, all of the contaminants, everything that you don't need. You need deeper connection to the water. You can imagine how when you drink the water, you feel it going down. Our tissues are 60% by water. It's the, probably the most important element. It's also something that we can't live without. value of water is going to rapidly increase as the climate warms up. I think we have to realize how sacred all the water is. But maybe you have a particular body of the water you consider sacred for yourself. Again, maybe that's your favorite lake or just even a pond, the one that gives you a certain sense of transcendence, certain capacity to resonate with the water source closely, be, be able to take on the purity of it. Realizing that it's very easy for us on this, where we are to come by, the water is always available for us most of the time. But there are places on earth where water is scarce, where a lot of people don't have an easy access to it. I think it's essential that we honor how lucky we are that we don't have this issue and send this positivity to to everyone who doesn't have access, easy access to water, realizing that it's an essential element. We have to have a good relationship with. So let's take two more water breaths, in through the nose, out through the mouth. Fire, inhale through the mouth, exhale through the nose. Same thing. Fire in our chests. Imagining being building fire. Imagine sensing the uprising energy of the cleansing. Fire can purify, can burn impurities of our emotional imbalances. <laughs> Inhaling through the mouth, exhaling through the nose. can imagine with each inhale, the fire grows a little bit bigger, as if you're, with your breath, blow on a wooden 
on calls and seeing fire rise. And think about your own personal relationship with fire. Oh. Maybe it scares you, maybe you love it, maybe you like being next to the fire source. Maybe it gives you a certain level of comfort. Whatever it is, that's your personal relationship. And we can learn to deepen that relationship by connecting the sense of fire in our chest and our breaths. So inhaling, imagining fire glowing brighter, being warmer. And then when we exhale, we can imagine the ashes and smoke dissipate, freeing our emotions from anything that doesn't belong there. If you have a particular situation where you've been struggling, this is a great time to offer fire, to cleanse it. You can put that into the fire and let it burn, releasing all the ashes and all the smoke as the result. Letting the fire become the actual cleansing power, cleansing energy. Of course, it's essential to realize that if the fire grows too much, it can be devastating. So there is a balance, just like with all other elements, if they're not in balance, they may cause more harm than benefit. So learn your own amount of fire that your body, heart, mind, and soul needs. Connect to your heartbeat if you can. Sense how the heart with each inhale speeds up a little and then with each exhale slows down. Following the rise and fall of the fire cycle. Exhale. When we blow on the fire, it becomes brighter. So is our heart. Take two more fire breaths here. And we'll transition to the air. Inhale and exhale through the mouth, connecting to the air all around us. Maybe you can sense your favorite smell. Maybe you can sense your favorite breeze or your favorite airflow. Maybe it's a particular part of the day when air has a particular qualities to it. Maybe the freshness in the morning or slight gentle breeze in the afternoon. Or maybe it's just really quiet air of the forest. It's deep smell of pine stimulating every cell of your brain. Pinein is the terpene that's very good for memory. Hands deeply inhaling the forest, the pine forest air. Maybe you can imagine being in the your favorite forest with its own favorite smell. Maybe you are 
by the ocean, sensing the salty smell of the ocean, smell of the seaweed, whatever it is that, that you prefer. So let's tune in here, see. Realizing that the, our sense of smell is the most rudimentary sense. It's the oldest one. It's the most directly connected to our thoughts. Our thoughts can be deeply influenced by that, by that sense. Having a deeper relationship with the air movements, air all around with the smells will allow us to maintain our mental plane clean, free from any unneeded thoughts, any mental impurities that are not serving us. Maybe it's uh, incessant concerns about something, or maybe it's a particular worry, particular thought about something. Let's for at least the time of this practice for a few more minutes, let's just breathe it out and let it all get moved with the air away from us. Just like a wind, it comes and then it takes away the leaves in a fall, moving them, scattering them taking them away from the trees. Same with us, we can purify our thoughts. Freeing leaves of our unneeded, unwanted thoughts being taken away with the breath, with the exhale. Can center your attention in the forehead and imagine a light blue color there, the color of the skies. Letting go of attachments to any particular thoughts, no matter how positive they may be or negative. It's very important that we learn that we are not our thoughts. The thoughts are only what's there. It's not. It doesn't have to represent who we are. They're useful. They're helpful. They help us to live this life. But ultimately, they have to be mastered and fully controlled. Don't let them be in charge of who you are. This part of the elemental breath is critical for that. Okay, now in the last couple of minutes, we'll switch to the ether. Inhale and exhale through both mouth and nose. Very gentle, very subtle breath. And here we have opportunity to purify the relationship with the divine the greater, whatever that means for you. This is the part of the practice where we allow for greater connection, where we realize that ultimately we are only part of the greater. And the more tuned we are into that, the more tuned we are into our intuition, the more tuned we are into our relationship with the divine, the easier it is for us to live our lives, the more and the faster we can intuit what we are supposed to be doing. This is also a place where we can try to make a sense of some of the ongoing tragedies in the world, where we don't have to judge, or we don't have to pretend that we know the answers, or think that we need to do something where we can fully relax into reason that there is some deeper meaning beyond all this, even if we and our limitations are completely incapable of understanding. 
This is where we can allow our own suffering to be given away, realizing that even that has a value, even that has a meaning, knowing that ultimately all of that has some specific importance, no matter how small it may appear to you. Ultimately, we are making ourselves a channel for this connection, making ourselves a channel for servicing the others, bringing good in the world, letting, letting our intention to be settled to the equality of us all, capacity to be fully present, fully engaged with the world. Realizing that we're all connected and all part of the one. So let's take just a couple more ether breaths. Actually, begin to come back and be wiggle your toes and fingers. Open your eyes slowly return to the room. It's so actually very good here to kind of brush your face. Sometimes we, um, when we do this, we close with kind of raising our hands, gathering the energy, bringing it into the body three times. I hope everybody can enjoy this absolutely marvelous weather. I don't think it will last for very long. See you all next Friday. Janet, if you're still here, what do we have next week? That's right. We have Tiffany Holt and Allison Glucksman will be back. So, so Tiffany is doing the wellness talk? Yes. You all want to be here for that. I am telling you, you're here for a treat. So Tiffany is a, our acupuncturist at CIM, and she has, she's been training. She practices a lot of the dietary and herbs. So I'm pretty sure she's going to talk about um, what's the best way of eating in a fall. Um, I hope I hope she talks about that. Is that an intent, Janet? Do you know? I'll, I'll check in with her. Yeah, I, check I in with her. She does that. Yeah, plant that plant that seed. Well, I will. I will. <laughs> All right, everybody. I, I'm gonna go and figure out what's going on with the car. It's the apparently I was told it's a bearings, which is not that cheap, but that's okay. <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you next Bye. week. Bye.